maybe I do marriage in the modern era. Um, my name is Abby Ostrakson and I'm going to be chairing the session today. Um, we really have to have been kind of living in a, in a cave or to have noticed marriage has really been in the air this year. Um, even if you um, went off and fled the country for the big day, uh, there was no hiding from the build up to uh, Will, Wills and Paints do. Um, and there have been government proposals to allow full gay marriage and offer a few tax breaks for married couples. Um, really ensured that marriage is a, a really hot political issue at the moment. And uh, not to mention the fact that our TV schedules are filled with uh, marriage programmes from a big practice, the wedding and don't have a bride. Um, for some, uh, the obsession with getting hitched seems to be a bit of a throwback to more conservative times. Uh, they see monogamy and two point four children um, as a bit of a straight jacket, particularly for women. Um, and in fact, uh, fewer couples are marrying now than at any point in the last century, while over a third of marriages uh, are ending in divorce. Um, so, what we really want to address uh, in this session are a few key questions. I'm sure that we'll uh, range over lots and lots of different things, but just to kind of set the, set the scene a little bit. Um, some of the questions that we're, we're looking at today would be, um, is our kind of flight from marriage um, simply about throwing off the shackles and embracing one relationship, or does it uh, reflect a fear of commitment itself? Um, are our reasons for marrying increasingly instrumental? Is marriage just a, another contractual agreement like buying a car or, or a house? Or in taking such a pragmatic approach to marriage, is there a danger of stripping it, it of its romantic mystique um, or even its normal work? Um, so helping us to unpick uh, those very big questions, um, I have a wonderful panel um, up here with me. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of them, Giles Fraser, couldn't make it, which if you've been following recent developments, I'm sure you'll understand why. Um, however, I have three brilliant speakers up here um, ready to take on the challenge. Um, my introductions almost certainly won't do them just to say so, so do check out their full biography um, on the website if you get a chance. Um, so first up, we're going to have uh, to my immediate right, Jenny Bristow, um, who's editor of the B Plus Abortion Review and author of Standing Up to Super Nanny. Jenny writes about parenting culture and intergenerational relationships and runs the editing service Contribute, as well as uh, Standing Up to Super Nanny. She's also a co-author of License to Hug, How Child Protection Policies are Poisoning the Relationship Between the Generations and Damaging the Voluntary Sector. Uh, Jenny writes the monthly Guide to the of Parenting on Spike and edits the website parentswithattitude.com um, and we're delighted that you've been here today, so welcome to Jenny. Um, uh, next. <laughs> um, next up uh, will be uh, Dr. Samantha Callum, the second time you get left. Um, she's Chairman of the Residence for Family, Early Years and Mental Health at the Centre for Social Justice. Um, Samantha has recognised as a research and policy expert in the field of family relationships and work-life uh, integration, and is an honorary research fellow at Edinburgh University and formerly a research consultant to major UK and international non-governmental organisations uh, aiming to strengthen family life. Uh, in this capacity, she chaired the Family Breakdown Working Group of the Social Justice Policy Commission <coughs> and the Family Law Review and Early Years Commission for the Centre for Social Justice. And prior to joining the uh, CSJ full-time, she was the Family and Society Policy Advisor in the Conservative Policy Union. Um, and I've no doubt Samantha will have a lot of really interesting insights on this issue. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, and finally, to my uh, far right, uh, we have Fiona Shaw, uh, award-winning actress and director of a major new production of Lake Stuff's Marriage of Figaro um, at the ENO. Um, I, I went to see uh, Fiona's production actually a couple of weeks ago and I have to say it was uh, brilliant. It's the first opera I've ever been to um, and I was blown away. So there are still a few tickets available for the last few performances and I highly recommend you try and get your hands on some of it. It's brilliant. Um, Fiona really needs a little introduction. Suffice to say, it has reams and reams of stage credits, um, including Mother Courage and Her Children and Happy Days at the National, Julian Seeds at the Barbican and numerous appearances uh, at the RSC. Uh, many of you will have seen them uh, on screen in the Harry Potter series, True Blood, Richard II and Child Retribution. Uh, Fiona received a CPD in 2001 and we're really delighted to have that here, so welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would just uh, like to thank uh, the ENO as well, who are uh, our partners for this particular session, uh, for their support um, with it. 
Okay, uh, so we have uh, very little time, uh, just an hour at lunchtime and lots to talk about, so let's get straight to it. The panellists are each going to take about three or four minutes uh, each, uh, firstly, just to outline briefly where they stand on the issues. Obviously not a big speech, uh, just to give us a, a starting point, and then I'll ask them a few questions up here on the panel. But what we really want to do is very quickly come out to you in the audience. Um, so do be ready with please, questions, thoughts uh, to add to the discussion. So it's very much intended to be a, a conversation uh, between everyone in the room. Um, and by no means, um, as I'm sure you know from what we went to the sessions there, the kind of black and white discussion. So do feel free to, to raise whatever points you'd like to during the discussion. Thank you. Um, yes, excuse me, before we begin, would it be possible for the speakers to stand if I can't be any person that's in the room? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, fine. So, Jenny, take us off. Um, hello, thanks, Abby. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, okay, so about 10 years ago, um, strangely, around right about the time that I got married, um, I wrote a little publication for the Institute of Ideas under uh, the similar title to this session called Maybe I Do Marriage and Commitment in Singleton Society. And um, what I was arguing in that publication, which I don't think it's entirely self-serving, I have to say, was that the decline in marriage um, and the kind of policy negativity around marriage in the noughties reflected a broader drift away from commitment in intimate relationships. And I thought this was kind of problematic, largely because it seemed to reflect not a new freedom, but rather a fear of trusting um, one's intimate partner. The, 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 the fear of using into seeing intimate relationships as the basis for responsibility, autonomy, um, <coughs> trust and support. And I thought the consequence of that was to make people kind of shy away from commitment to intimate relationships, make them more isolated and basically more dependent on official sources of support for um, guidance in intimate life. Now, again, I don't, I don't think I'm just contrary, but now that marriage has become really back into fashion in policy circles, the way that Abby suggested. I don't really like that either. Um, I get this kind of feeling that, uh, you know, when the current government uh, and think tanks like the Centre for Social Justice, just to pick on uh, some other here, um, talk about family autonomy and self-reliance uh, and, um, self and all the things that are supposed to be kind of good about marriage and why marriage needs promoting, um, often what's meant by that is that the resources of the state just need to be used to find a more effective way of telling people what to do. Um, so instead of the language of anything goes, as we had, I think, um, at the beginning of the noughties, we now have the kind of uh, language of marriage is good for your health, it's the responsible thing to do, and trying to find lots of different ways of kind of encouraging people to, uh, to get married. Right from when they're at school, actually, we have you know, a, a big interest in the promotion of relationship education in schools. Um, the Centre for Social Justice has talked about the creation of a marriage and relationships institute. Uh, I don't know whether that's to kind of credentialise marriage in some way. Um, we get an ongoing discussion about the, the need for free parenting classes. And it does make me wonder, you know, if this is not the nanny state, what's not the nanny state about it? I mean, it seems to me to be very much a similar kind of thing of really um, shoehorning people's personal choices into a way that makes them more um, open to official messages about how one should live one's personal life. So, um, because we're all being brief, I mean, I do think that the first principle of marriage in a civilised modern society uh, should be freedom. Uh, that's the freedom to decide who to spend your life with and the freedom to take responsibility with your partner for that life that you've made together. And the first stage in getting that freedom in marriage and intimate relationships is that policymakers need to get out of the marital bed. <laughs> Actually, um, I think I think if you read our work, what is very clear is we are the very thing we are trying to avoid is undue dependence on the state. The Social Justice Policy Group was uh, very unusual in 2006. Uh, it was commissioned by David Cameron. It's the only piece of work that the CSJ has ever done on commission from a political party. And as people might be aware, David Cameron came into leadership. Third party got a whole bunch of people to do some new thinking. I was one of them. I said to you, Duncan Smith, and he asked me, I'm not a member of the Conservative Party, why would you want me to help you? And he said, That's what I want. Um, dot, dot, dot. I won't say more on that, I'll get him into trouble. Anyway, um, but 
the lens through which we have always looked through marriage is, is a social justice issue. And by that, I mean it's an equally valued institution across the social spectrum, but it's, the, it's not equal access to it. There are significant cultural and economic barriers further down the social spectrum, which make it harder for people to get married and realise their aspirations. And the, the, the delinking between um, of, of marriage and parenthood has been most devastating in its effects further down the social spectrum. We produce a lot of research on this, and there's going to be far more dependence when people break up. You're far more likely to break up from the partner, the parent of your, uh, your children if you weren't married. Just a couple of statistics um, on this uh, instability angle. If you were married when your child was born, 9% um, of married couples will split up by the time the child's five, compared to 26% of cavities, compared to 60% of people who weren't even living together when the child was born. And, and I am very glad, it's a very sad subject, but I'm very glad that fatherlessness is becoming just as important an issue. It's a time when marriage is coming back in the public domain. And by that I mean, um, when we, uh, when we look at the, something like the Millennium Cohort study, look at father involvement, let me just get this right, 15% of all children are born into homes without a dad. Um, and by, uh, by three years, almost half of them will have lost contact with their fathers. Quite apart from the, the dad that's put up, it's very hard to negotiate the relationship with the, with the, with the mum, because that's the major determinant, that's why relationship education is so important. If adults get on well, it's good for kids in a whole variety of ways. I know I'm running out of my two minutes, I think you're all really desperate to feel the so I'm just going to wrap up very quickly. Why does fatherlessness matter? I heard a leading figure uh, referring to the myth of fatherlessness a couple of weeks ago, um, which really angered me, because again, we talk to the, frankly, the most disadvantaged um, in society, we, all of our work, we, we spend lots of our time talking to voluntary sector groups, people up and down the country, who've been badly affected by government policy and badly affected by social trends. And research came out yesterday in the Times, a report by a charity called Ad Action, um, the chair of which chaired our, our gangs report, which is now back in centre stage for obvious reasons. And what was beginning to come out through that report was <laughs> just what effect fatherlessness has on children's sense of self, self, self esteem, their, their whole self concept, how they imagine themselves. And then, for me, the most poignant thing was. That just one thing that came out of the focus group research was nobody acknowledges that it's really hard to go through life without knowing my father. So that's why we are, I wouldn't say we are in the bedroom or in the bed or whatever, but, but we as policy advisors feel compelled to talk about the institution that is most likely to lead to children growing up with both their parents. 97% of all um, uh, parents who are intact by the time they're comes intact by the time the child is 15 are married. What's that say? Thank you. when it alteration finds true or false. <laughs> I think everything alters when it alteration finds, and no, no more than modern times, when the nature and state of marriage uh, changes all the time, because when you start talking about the future of marriage, the bringing of children, uh, the importance of that, whether children suffer or don't suffer with one or two parents, all of these things, I think, get focused on the day of the marriage. And I've spent in the last 10 years just on two particular shows to do with marriage. One is Medea, which takes place on the day of a marriage. Uh, Medea is very upset because her husband, who she thought, whose love would not alter when it alters in France, is marrying somebody else. And on that day, he finds that he has two wives, as it were, which sort of makes me think of Oscar Wilde's quote about bigamy is when you have got one wife too many. Monogamy is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on that day, because of her great love 
Jason, her husband, in her mind, is getting married to somebody else. She, uh, it, it's taken to its absolute darkest potential, and she kills uh, that wife, and she also kills her own children. So days of weddings are often in Greek tragedy set up as the day in which something huge might happen. They're full of tension, and just more recently in the marriage of Figaro, which is, you know, it's ostensibly um, a light comedy. It's about a servant who just wants to marry uh, another servant, and they're going to have a marriage, whatever that is, in the context of being both owned by a, a count, which could be a multinational, whoever owns the, the kind of mortgaged life of most, that most of us have. And uh, it's about their day of trying to become married. And very interestingly, even though it's Mozart and Aponte in the very 18th century and filigree, very early on in Act One, you notice that there's a tension between both Figaro and Susanna uh, in their very first scene. There's lots of beautiful music that makes you feel that they're unified, but in between the music you can feel the shards of tension. So whether marriage in the modern era uh, should go on ignoring the fact that uh, marriage in the previous eras have always signaled a huge tension. And I think it seems to me that, the, that the, the tensions that are being brought up in marriages with each generation depend on the generation that we're in. I think for us now, um, I traveled here with my uh, <coughs> today, who's also unmarried, uh, he has a son, and we were talking about faith, hope, and charity in marriage. <coughs> and I think hope and charity are still two things that can accompany a couple going into a marriage, but faith has certainly take, taken a knocking. very much. Um, so just a couple of questions before I will come very quickly out to you because I'm sure that the audience have, have lots to say. Um, but I mean, Jenny, just picking up on, on what Samantha is saying here about, you know, you know, she's putting forward some facts here. You know, uh, couples are more likely uh, to break up if they're not married. That has an effect on children. You know, um, Ian Duncan Smith has said um, family breakdown across the country, 40 billion a year uh, because of the resulting of uh, educational failure, drug and alcohol addiction, behavioural problems and crime, in his words. Um, so, um, is that important to you? I mean, what, what do you say to kind of some of this sort of facts? Um, I, think, I think people have got to want to get married and they've got to want to stay married and I think that's the, that's the precondition for it. I think marriage as an institution has changed enormously over recent decades and um, whilst I think you could have argued, say, 40, 50 years ago, even, that um, it, it, there was a lot that was problematic about marriage in terms of the, the role that it ascribed to people, you know, the, the breadwinner versus the housewife, all of those kind of things. Um, and, you know, I think the, the arguments for um, more um, permissive laws surrounding marriage, I think, were very well made because they were reacting to a very real problem. Um, what you have now is a situation where I think there is a, there is a cultural trend against commitment. I think that is problematic, um, commitment in inter intimate relationships, but I don't think you solve that by trying to bring back the institutional way that marriage used to have, or by kind of forcing people to stick with the way that's working culturally. You know, the cultural message of the time is that was good for you, okay? So that actually really contradicts the spirit of marriage, which isn't about that at all. And so, you know, if, if it's a cultural problem, then I think you've got to deal with it at a cultural level rather than trying to prescribe people's choices. I was sure there's an awful lot we're all in agreement on the panel. I think um, I think there is a cultural problem, firstly, but but secondly, this idea that we're kind of frog marching people up the aisle with a tax break or suggesting we should do that, it, we're not. What well, we're not by saying we. I mean, we as a policy um, think like they've recommended it because we are not the Conservative Party. To get that on the record. What I started by saying was um, there are unrealised. So if we were pushing, we'd really be pushing water uphill if people didn't want to get married. But there are these barriers. Now, I don't know if you saw the Humphreys programme this week, the Future State of Welfare, but I found that utterly poignant. A young lady, single, uh, you know, single mum, uh, saying how hard it was to, to work and have a, a child. And she was in tears. You could see craggy old Humphreys kind of looking a bit kind of sad himself, really. Because she's saying, I had no idea. I was very young. I had no idea when I had had a baby, just how hard it would be. And what we've, by 
By telling people don't aspire to a long-term commitment by dissing marriage, by saying it doesn't matter anymore, and government did, the last government very much did say that, we're actually ripping away very useful kind of um, boundary lines for people that they, as I say, they actually want when you look at the aspirations. So I, I don't think it's about, um, I don't think for a minute it's about forcing people to do something they don't want, but it's about putting back cultural support for an institution that people I'd like to buy into. I mean, just coming on that, and I might want to bring you in here. <laughs> you know, but I mean, the, the kind of fact is that fewer and fewer people are getting married. So, I mean, you know, a lot of people presumably therefore are doing that for a reason. I mean, why should it necessarily be the case that couples need marrying at all? I mean, it, it seems, you know, that it could be the case that people are deciding that that's not a modern way of living, that they'd like to live their. Live their um, you know, their relationships in a different way, which could be um, just as committed as a marriage. So why is it that you need that kind of, you know, institution of marriage to be committed to someone? Can you not be in a long-term committed relationship without getting married? Yes, and maybe there's something uh, about the coupling of couples, which is that uh, in this country, due to mortgages, etc., there's a very isolated notion of what marriage is. The, the nuclear family is nuclear. <laughs> nuclear explosive, really, that there isn't a wider context in which children could be born, which could be a much wider, now I don't think you can institute that with a policy, but I also read that 40% of divorcing couples probably want to make up, and 10% of divorced couples want to make up, so there's sort of no, there's no system for people to recover what might have been a mistake in the first place. But I don't think social policies of their own uh, allow people to think about how to have children. And I'm not sure having children is the same thing as being married. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was a, I read, you know, uh, the stats saying children are just as likely to be born um, out of wedlock as they are in wedlock. But yes, and people are married yeah. later, way beyond their childbearing yeah, age. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. marrying each other for other reasons. They're yeah. married because they want to be unified with somebody and they want to share, um, you know, Relaxation yeah. and houses, houses with each other. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's very natural. My, my immediate thought is: is that a problem? I, you know, do, do children need to be? Uh, in a, in a the problem is faith. I think the problem is what do we believe it is at the moment that we're walking in the aisle. That the tension I referred to doesn't have to be murderous. Is that any two people turning up on the wedding day are saying something to each other, and they, we all have to agree what it is that they're saying to each other. Jenny, do you want to... I mean, I agree with that. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I think. When you said that faith in marriage is, is taking knocking, I think that's kind of really true. I think people are sort of, and there's an element where culturally we're very sort of naive and critical about it, um, and also sort of very um, sort of too realistic, if you like. Um, so I thought, you know, ma the marriage of Figaro, one of the themes that comes out of that is forgiveness, for example, and that sort of sense of just sort of, well, things do change, you know, um, we're rough with the smooth, all of those kind of things. Well, I think the, the culture of the times is much more sort of um, brittle in and short term around um, intimate relationships. But just to say, I mean, I do think it's the, to the credit of the sense of social justice, actually, um, that there is a discussion going on about marriage now, that it needs sort of seeks to have a discussion about marriage rather than, for example, um, a discussion about a cohabitation law, which I know there's a discussion about as well, which I always thought was a much sort of worse example of how you try and put sticking plaster onto the situation sort of say, well, people are getting married, so they're living together, so let's kind of make it legal that they're living together. And of course, the reason why people aren't getting married is precisely because they don't want to enter into that relationship. So I do think it's a very valuable um, discussion to have, and I don't want the sense of social justice for putting it on the table. Yeah, I just completely agree with Jenny. Um, uh, institutionalising cohabitation when a lot of people are seeking this, this is their right to stay outside the law if that's what they want to do. So, um, I, I and I think yes, you can have a, a long-term community relationship and not be married. Of course, we we probably know people who are in that situation, but it is rare. My 97% stat is um, can I tell uh, you know. Uh, it's testament to how, how rare it is, so I wouldn't want to idealise it, because it's the actual, we, I'm so glad we've got somebody who's been thinking about the ceremony of marriage and the actual act of getting married, because, I mean, I'm an anthropologist, um, and I think it does make a difference. We're very ritually lean in this society, but these, these uh, rites of passage that we go through 
Um, they, I think they, we, we underestimate just what, what a difference they can make, as long as they are kind of married, if you like, with the attitudes and behaviors that say, this is not me being a princess for the day. Um, I'm going to have to really work at this, and, and I might actually need some help. And this is going to make Jenny think, ah, professionals, experts. But the people who are really good at relationship education in the community are not the experts. They're often people from the community themselves and the voluntary sector, again, who have learned tips about how to not throw the crockery when the first child is born, and you are so dog tired that um, throwing the crockery is probably the last, the least of your worries. Anyway, so. Yeah. Right, before they agree too much, I think we should come yeah, to the audience. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to take a whole bunch of questions, then I'll come back. We've all been here to answer this. And then I'll come back again, so don't worry. Uh, right. Oh, don't, 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 and there's a mic flying around. <laughs> oh, right. Um, I just wanted to say that one of the things that concerned me was the word that you kept using, which was aspirations to get married, or aspiration to have a long-term relationship. Because I think that um, aspiration should be about the things we achieve as human beings and the potential that we can create in our lives, and you know, being fantastic actresses, creating good drama, that kind of thing. Um, and um, the, the relationships that we have um, are about our humanity, not about... I mean, obviously, aspiration is about our humanity as well, but I just feel like it means more than, than um, a relationship with somebody else, but something that we can achieve as humans. And I just thought it was very interesting, as somebody who went to see Media, um, which I thought was absolutely fantastic, um, it's, it's very interesting that she says, you know, if you don't want me, then I'm going to kill our children. And it's, it feels like a very much a metaphor for today, you know, if you can't have a relationship, you, the children suffer. Um, and in media, you know, if you don't stay and you don't love me, then the children will suffer. But, you know, in a much more extreme way, being killed. Thank you. Is there any Yeah. Um, Thanks. As a man, I found your presentations a bit Spartan. Um, <laughs> I don't, know you, I don't know if any of you said the word love, um, and I didn't get a great sense of idealism, although I can see you were getting that. <laughs> apart from all the social policies, do you know anybody whose love has got deeper and that is more in love with the person they married as their marriage has gone forward? And is that the right question to ask? Because I'm, I'm getting a real sense that I'm in a social policy discussion <laughs> rather than looking at some beautiful women you're going to inspire me about love. I just. <laughs> 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 It's very different to being in fear of commitment. Um, so I think if I was fortunate enough to have a two, ten year relationship before I die, great. Um, and second of all, the stats that you're referring to, we're mainly commenting on people who've got married at an age where we thought marriage was for 20, 30 years down the line. We're now living in an aging population. So I think for many people, when they figure or when they contemplate the idea of marriage, the idea of being with someone for 60, 70, 80 plus years is quite a different contemplation. And it's not the same as actually being happy and in a relationship with someone that you love. So, thank you. Stuart Wynn. Um, John Stuart Mill in his book, which uh, I've been reading, probably his Frank for ages now, done a book similar on it, on tolerance, uh, makes the superb point, I think, that the point about liberty and freedom is that what you want in society is, you want, is that you want the right type of people. Like, it's not that you want them to necessarily behave the right way, but you want them to be the right type of people. And what he means by that is you, you want them to be free and you want them to have a genuine sense of moral responsibility. So even if they get drunk sometimes, even if they fight sometimes, even if they do whatever, as long as they have a sense of genuine moral responsibility, they will feel responsible for their actions. 
And the important thing in this discussion, I think, is the idea of the autonomous family. Because the liberal notion of the autonomous family was that the autonomous family was a good in and, its, in and of itself. Right? It was a good thing because it was about self-responsibility. Now, when Samantha's talking, it's very interesting because she seems to talk about marriage as a way that you might become responsible or you might start to behave in the correct way so you'll become a good parent or you'll become a good something. It seems to be more about trying to use marriage as a route towards people behaving correctly rather than having any genuine respect and belief in the idea of the autonomous family. And then you, you carried on Samantha and said, really, people don't get married, but they really want to. And we want to just help them get married because they really want to. And again, it seems a very patronizing idea about people where you don't seem to genuinely think that they either are autonomous beings or can become autonomous beings without your help and without marriage along the line to start to behave correctly. Yeah, I just wanted to um, bring up the point about childcare because you gave a, very, a picture of um, a woman, a young woman who'd had a child and was trying to work with a child who was crying to know how difficult it would be. How on earth is getting married going to help that? What would help that would be good childcare, which we, women need and still don't have? A kind of women's liberation movement wanted 24 hour childcare for every child. Now, married or not, I think all women would stand up for that, and, and men as well. And marriage has got nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> this person right in very front, and then that's it for now, but I, I am coming back to it. Otherwise that will be completely overloaded, there we are. Thanks. Um, it's kind of similar to the point that Stuart made at the back, in a different way. Relationship education must now be definitely in the top ten, maybe at the top of the top ten, of my most stupid, t meaningless concepts, which is routinely used all the time in discussions about anything to do with society and how we improve it. It just trips off people's tongues. What we need is more relationship education. What we need more is more relationship education. So if it actually means something, it doesn't mean anything at all. You can't educate people to have relationships. It completely overcomplicates it. There's things that we learn in life which we cannot be taught, and having relationships is one of them. And we learn them by merit of our own experience, our imagination, our encounters with deep, profound feelings, primarily love in this instance. Nobody can teach you how to fall in love and be in love. It's a stupid, stupid idea. And one of the even more stu stupid aspects of it is it actually utterly undermines the concept of proper education, i.e. what you should learn in school. And now people like you, Samantha, are trying to make all this stuff happen in school. So not only are you undermining love and the real meaning in relationships, you're also on a pathway to trying to destroy proper schooling. Um, and I really think <laughs> that you need to have a think about what on earth you need. I mean, you described it a little bit in when you came back on Jenny with some banal example of somebody who you could talk to if you smashed a teapot because you were too tired because you'd had a child. I mean, I sometimes do that type of thing with my mum, and that's called real life, and that's what people do. So maybe my mum is a relationship educator. I'll let her know when I phone her up. But really, I think that your CSJ needs to just get a bit real about what relationships are like and, and what education really is. Okay, thank you very much, Lordy. Separating out aspirations and achievement when it comes to relationship, I think, I think it is hard to sustain a relationship over the life course. I think it is achievable. Um, I think uh, we we cop out if we say, well, don't try. It's not. It's just going to be impossible. Um, and bear in mind, children. It, the children's worst fear is that their parents will split up. And when you do the surveys, they've done, done them several times. 70% of all kids say they want warring parents to stay together. Now, high conflict marriages are as devastating for kids as low conflict divorces. And the point about that is that when when children see their parents split up, and it's kind of almost before anything bad's happened, they self-attribute, they think no relationship is sustainable. So I think conflict, we've got to, we've got to do what we can to reduce it. But 
But to say that the best thing for kids is if their parents set up, that's not what kids think. But the interesting thing is that it switches with the parents. 30% of parents say we need to, 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 uh, to keep working at this for, for the sake of the children. Terribly unfashionable stuff. Do I know anybody? Um, I love, I think there's been some fantastic questions. I love the question about where is love and all this. And you know, you do kind of put your protective policy shroud on when you start talking about this stuff. Um, and um, this, you know, we, I think that the, the I, I was really hoping Phil was going to do the whole sonnet actually, but love is not love when alteration, when alteration finds. I think um, I, I have been married for, I was trying to remember, I can just say with confidence it's nearly a quarter of a century, but I can't remember exactly how many years. And, um, and I think you do find lots of things change. And um, it's interesting on the childcare front because um, my husband was made redundant and he's he started his own business and he's doing the teenage childcare, which I'm so relieved about because I found it far harder than the baby childcare. And I think this idea that we just need fantastic childcare and we don't need dads around, which I'm, you probably think I'm being a bit unfair saying that, but that's that was at the heart of what I think this young lady was saying. It wasn't just it's hard to hold down a job and look after my child, it's going it alone is really hard. Um, and if you're going it alone and you've got a fantastic education and lots of money, it's a very, very different lifestyle to what we find when we go around the rough states. And finally, on relationship education, I would just say, um, the, 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 the throwing the teapot, um, yes, we can all do that, regard, regardless of how much pressure we're actually under, but the, what I mean by relationship education, um, is is just I'll say really simple things that that I think we all need to. I have to tell myself time and again. There's something called stops. I can never remember what S stands for, but the T O P T is don't think the worst. Always don't opt out, and P is avoid putting down. And these are all based in research, so we make them simple. But putting down content, showing content is the biggest killer of relationships. And a lot of people in this room, may I say probably don't realise that, showing contempt and looking, being very disdainful of your partner to try and score points, that's what S is. Now these are things that you might think, oh well I already know that, well actually do we really know that? Do we really know um, how, to, how to cultivate relationships? The fact that a third of all people in this country have suffered down a breakdown suggests we're not brilliant at it. Alright, sorry, I've put too much time. Well, where is, where is love in all this? Um, I mean, it's a very big issue, isn't it? Um, but, I mean, I, I do actually think that love and marriage are separate things. I mean, we're very fortunate if they coincide. Um, you know, but, no, no, I'm serious, this is the reason, you read as many novels as I do, this is a fairly recent thing, you know, over the last century. Companion and marriage, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, things change, whatever. Marriage is a, a, a lifestyle arrangement. Um, love is love, and the thing is, I think it's, it's one of these things that you can't, um, and anyway, we haven't got time now, try to kind of boil it down in terms of, you know, well, which bit is what, and in which circumstances it works, which bit it doesn't, yeah, circumstances it doesn't work. But I think that there is this thing, when we talk about the kind of problem of commitment, I think what's interesting in, in that is that, um, you know, there is this sort of cultural idea about love, which is a little bit teenage. Um, which you know, you have it and then that's it and then you move on. Which obviously is completely different to marriage. And so that's where I think that, if that makes any sense, I think the, the, the cultural schism lies. And so I think there is a sort of a reality to marriage to sort of say, well, you know, we, we do have to sort of say it's not exactly the same thing as love, but often, you know, the two things go together and it's very good if they do. Um, on uh, the, well, the, the students at the back mentioned the, um, the autonomous family as part of this discussion, and I do think, I suppose this is where my interest in it really comes, in the sense that where I think marriage as, you know, it's not an institution as it was, but it is still a kind of, you know, important legal contract and living arrangement, I think where it has a really important role to play is because it does uh, formally indicate that people have a responsibility to one another and to their children and a bit of space in which to exercise that responsibility and to look after each other and everything that's not just being completely open to um, you know, a constant, official, I mean, Samantha will call it guidance and support, you know, I call it bossiness, um, <laughs> rulemaking. And I think the, the problem is, I mean, the problem I have with this sort of new promotion of marriage is it tries to kind of get the worst of all possible worlds because it sort of 
says, well, we want marriage, but we want the kind of marriage that is created on the foundation of an openness to ongoing um, official, official relationship support. I mean, I think there's nine stages or something, some policy document talks about, where from the cradle to the grave, you're getting advised on how you should run your married life. Now, that isn't, um, that to me is, that makes the whole kind of concept of, uh, you know, marriage, family life, freedom in personal life, it makes it meaningless. If all it is is about making sure that you live in your house and you're constantly doing the right thing. And I think, you know, just to kind of briefly mention the, the dadlessness thing, you know, I think, well, you know, if you empty out fatherhood of its kind of content of having that sense of, you know, autonomy and responsibility and being a relationship, then, you know, that, that is when you get to a situation where people think, well, why, you know, why live together? And so I think, you know, you've got to give some content and some freedom to these relationships if you want people to, to you know, to, to kind of live according to them. Well, I just think to love and be loved is the rocket fuel of life. And it probably is the rocket fuel that gets people to be married in the first place, whatever the history of marriage. And I do think that Samantha has a point, is that once children come, or that there's a sort of, um, uh, if there's a falling off on that, it, from that, something else happens in a marriage. But love and marriage, they may not go together like a horse and carriage, but they, but, they, but they are the reason why people do now not marry each other. And they're often the reason why people divorce each other, is that they then start to love someone else. And I, I think probably in that way, you know, the gentleman who said that we're not discussing love, I think that that would be almost another discussion. Love is a huge force in the world, and it is both as good as it is evil. So, be careful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to come back out to the audience. We are so pushed for time, so the quicker you speak, the more people I can get in. Uh, okay, let's uh, start uh, here. I'd just like to come back on Fiona Shaw's idea that modern marriage is part of some vision of the nuclear family that excludes other people and other ways of raising children. <laughs> because I definitely found for me, when I was cohabiting with my wife, that was a nuclear arrangement for which my parents were excluded and which they were trying to break up, ditto hers. When we married, I mean, marriage almost necessarily involves parents of the couple. It, holds out the relationship with something that parents can invest in, both financially and in terms of support, and even in terms of trying to love their sons and daughters rather than trying to chase them away. I mean, in a sense, I think that's almost the most important aspect of it, that if you look from the point of view of children, it's a way of helping parents become active grandparents. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's one hand that I can't see the person attached to it. I think it's degenerating to talk about family and I want to talk about marriage. And my question is the, the person who pronounces you husband and wife is either a minister of religion or a representative of the state. So if you don't believe in a mythical creature, or actually do not want the state to interfere in your personal life, what is the panel's view of the modern marriage, especially since we live in multicultural Britain, where you might have bigamy, polygamy, or other models? Okay, thank you. So, uh, here. Oh, okay, here. Just two brief points. Um, we seem to be, um, I think the point that perhaps needs to be made is that surely marriage is difficult to defend because marriage in a way does turn, long-term marriage does depend upon this idea of commitment and people staying in a relationship with each other through boredom and all the perhaps inevitable problems of living with anybody. And therefore it is difficult to defend in a modern age, in a modern consumer age. And just secondly, you were talking about um, cohabitation earlier, but can we be so sure with cohabiting long-term couples that it is also 50-50, and that one partner doesn't want marriage, and I think it, which is a legal commitment, as you rightly said, more than the other? And does the general cu culture, which doesn't seem to think marriage is that important, doesn't it really rather side with the partner 
who is commitment light, mm -hmm. as opposed to one who wants commitment. And our weaker people, the weaker partners, in a sense being undermined by a culture that doesn't support marriage. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this lady here. I have two questions for Fiona, really. Uh, the first is, uh, it's been said that Jane Austen doesn't portray any happy long-term marriages apart from that naval couple, I can't remember their name. Happy yes. Wentworth. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it would seem to be as, uh, also true of Shakespeare and maybe many other great writers as well. And yet we know that long-term, intimate, loving marriages have existed since the dawn of time. And I wonder if you have any idea as to why we find it so difficult to portray it in great literature. So that's my first question. My second question is even more important. I just want to pick up what Samantha said and say, please, please, will you give us the whole sonnet? We don't have enough time. time. Okay, right, look, there's a, a person in pink over here with blonde hair. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to say, I was interested in what Fiona said about the absence of faith um, going down the aisle, and I think that's very interesting. Have we lost the ability to believe in ourselves, in another person, remaining true. And that made me really feel the absence of Giles Fraser on our panel. Well, our panel yeah. sound doing wonderfully, but yeah. I wonder, does that reflect also a loss of faith in religion, a loss of belief in certain cert certainties? Um, when I got married, we found a wonderful vicar who talked us through the vows in a very, very meaningful way. And I think everyone's kind of laying into Samantha because she talks about um, wisdom from a sort of social science perspective, but maybe you wouldn't attack it so much when it comes from a minister of religion. Our minister just talked to us about what those vows meant. And I can honestly say that all of that wisdom that you're talking about, don't put people down, you know, the, the sort of idea that love's a verb, you know, you have to act it, you have to do it. And I just have my wedding vows in my head every day. And I just kind of think, isn't there room for a little bit more faith? You know, where is our society going to find that? Okay, thank you. Um, there's a guy here. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first one was just the statistics that were used to defend it were completely no causal links at all, you know. Um, and that's, I just think that's really, really um, weak, <coughs> you know, uh, in terms of understanding um, you know, fatherlessness or those sorts of concepts. You know, I mean, fatherlessness being the, one, the first example, you know, so kids not having fathers that impacting badly on their lives, we're missing the point. You know, this is fathers taking responsibility for raising their children in whatever context they are in, whether they're married, separated, non-married, that's a really important thing. It's not about whether the state imposes marriage. We're forgetting that it's not a neutral concept. The idea that we that was raised that oh, well, it used to be like this with sex roles and the, the breadwinner and the um, the housewife. The idea that that's still not culturally relevant, even whether it's historical or across loads of different cultures around the world, across um, class structures in our own society. You know, suggesting that marriage isn't a value laden concept that imposes things, particularly on women in relationships to certain classes, um, is for me completely missing the point and is within that context as well. You know, childcare being the option, loads and loads of other options. It's so much more complicated and, and marriage for me is, is, is imposes so many negative concepts. Okay, thank you. There's someone right in the very back, because I can't see them. I saw their hand. Hello. <laughs> um, so I was wondering about how you think about the idea of friends. And I think like a lot of people sort of get married just for the sake of like the ceremony because like um, they sort of like since especially girls since very young age they sort of plan <coughs> oh I want this for my wedding I want this and I want that but then I think say traditionally if there was no such thing as maybe a ceremony then maybe um, then maybe sort of like they would think oh if we get married. If, Hence, say for example, we want to break up in the future, we have to go through a long divorce, but maybe they wouldn't have to if they don't get married. But I think a lot of people do think that, like, the wedding is sort of that's what, in a way, they look forward to most without thinking about it and rather actually doing it. Okay, thank you. And, um, uh, okay, one more here then. 
my, I know I'm a lot younger than some of the people here, and I don't know a huge amount about marriage. In fact, I only attended a marriage for the first time last week. And it was between my aunt and my uncle, and they've lived in in law And they've lived together for the last 18 years. They've got three children together. And during the vows, when they swapped rings, and my auntie was saying, this is a symbol of your love to me, my uncle just started laughing. And he was, he was weeping with laughter, and so was the registrar, and so was everyone there. Because it is sort of ridiculous to think these people have lived together for 18 years. They've got three children. How can a piece of metal symbolise their love for each other? You know, Their children symbolise their love, and their life together symbolise their love. And, you know, I, I, I was born in with a set of single parent, my mum looks after me. And I don't feel that marriage is what keeps people together, it's their love for each other, it's the, the laughter that they share with each other. It's not a marriage, and it's not an institutional promise that you make to each other, it's the lifestyle that you have together. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry, audience, but I have to leave it there. Um, so, um, Fiona, would you like to respond to whatever you, you'd like to. I'll let you uh, all do that first and then you can have a 30 second sum up for your final words. Just very briefly, uh, there's, a, there's a line of Wilkes point which is uh, always go reach to the limit of your longing. And I think a literature uh, uh, or theatre or novels usually are exploring a person reaching to the limit of their longing. And they often the book or the play ends at the point at which they do mar marry. In uh, Much Ado About Nothing, Beatrice is silent when Benedict says, come, I will stop your mother. <coughs> She's silent after that. Rosalind suddenly changes character at the end of As You Like It. And I only use these things because they're sort of the imaginative architects of our society. And that then the problems of marriage are left for real life, not for art. Um, just to say, I, I don't, I, I'm not sure what people do. I think, I just always say this when we talk about marriage, I don't actually care whether people get married or not um, in the, because of the, the changing meaning to the institution and all of that. But in relation to some of the, the recent comments, but I do think it still retains, marriage still retains a huge kind of practical and symbolic significance. And that's why, you know, when we have kind of discussions about marriage, they're not really just discussions about, um, you know, what people are doing and who they happen to be with on that particular day. They are discussions about what culturally, and to an extent politically, but that's why we're talking about the policy sense, what culturally we, we, you know, we want out of um, society in terms of people uh, making those good commitments to each other. So um, I think it's well worth discussing as well as, uh, dare I say, doing. <laughs> uh, firstly, I, I completely agree with this comment on the, the second rule, because that's really at the heart of the CSJ's interest in marriage. Um, the, you said that a culture that is commitment light um, kind of favours the person with, with more power already. And we, as I, as I said right from the outset, um, that this kind of uh, downgrading, downplaying the importance of commitment, we have found that this really does accentuate disadvantage throughout society. And we, we're talking about, um, when we talk about family breakdown, and nobody was talking about that until the mid noughties it was a, a real kind of indictment on the policy community and I think I think the academic community as well because it does have such a it, it is a driver and effect of poverty. It's, it isn't just caused by poverty, it fuels it. And I think the um the, the there have been other very, very useful comments about grandparents and and paternal grandparents are always at a disadvantage, frankly, even when the couple were married and there was a very kind of definite commitment there and there's a very official stake in the child. But they are even more disadvantaged when there was a very informal, when it was a less formal um, arrangement before before people had children. So I think I think these public and private commitments um, we we need both, frankly. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to leave my last bit for my last bit. You have okay, I'll finish. My <laughs> I love the question from the lady um, uh, about modern marriage. What is modern marriage? And I do actually. I'm such an optimist. You probably think, but. I think the best days of marriage are yet to come, where we have the, uh, the, the things that we normally associate with marriage, kind of durability, expectation of longevity, commitment, etc., but new dimensions, which are um, an expectation of intimacy. It's gone beyond companionship. It's, it is this kind of what Gibbons talks about, kind of um, a consul of love, etc., uh, but, but also equality. It's, it's 
vital, vital to the modern <coughs> relationship that there's an expectation of equality. So I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real kind of, a, I'd say, an optimist about where marriage is going. Thank you, Samantha. Now, Fiona, you had a request. Would you like to finish us up with that? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> 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 Right, we'll leave it at that then. Well, thank you. Can we uh, thank very much?